Hey everyone, I wanted to jump on here and do a quick video for you guys and respond to some claims made by Zach Bauer of New to Torah. Uh, Zach is someone with whom I'm pretty friendly for the most part. We agree on a lot of things. We both love Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, and of course we love the Torah, God's commandments. Um, but we also disagree on some things too, and that's okay. Uh, one significant disagreement I have with Zach is regarding the book of Enoch, or properly known as uh, First Enoch. I've written articles on this, and I've done videos on this topic that you can check out. Uh, but basically, to give a quick summary, my position is that the book of Enoch is significant. It was known among the Judaisms of the Second Temple era, including the Apostles, and it gives us val a valuable window into some of the beliefs and ideas among the Judaisms of that time period. However, it is not scripture or inspired by God. The Jews, including the Dead Sea Scroll community, never considered it scripture. Christianity has almost universally rejected it. Of course, we know Yeshua and the apostles, they never considered it scripture either. And I've linked some resources down below in, in the description uh, that demonstrate all of this. Well, Zach, he takes the position that actually the book of Enoch is scripture. And uh, here he is talking about a new series that he's working on in which he's going to attempt to demonstrate this. Here's what he says. I know I've been talking about for a while now, uh, the series I have coming out, on the Book of Enoch, uh, basically defending the Book of Enoch, where I try to prove, and I will prove, that I believe it is inspired, it should be considered scripture, and Enoch, in fact, did write it. I'm looking forward to seeing what Zach comes up with and responding uh, to his claims in future videos, but why is this important? Why do I care to respond to Zach on this? Well, because we're dealing with God's word here, we can't just add what we want to the scriptures and call it inspired. This is a hot topic for me. I'm actually working on a series uh, for 119 Ministries on the canon of scripture. And um, the idea that we can just elevate certain pseudepigrapha, which is what First Enoch is, it's a type of literature in the Second Temple era that was a very popular type of literature. Uh, we can't just elevate what we want uh, to the status of God's word and, and call it inspired by God. This is an incredibly destructive idea, especially when recalling writings that are not God's word, God's word. So anyway, in this video that I'm doing right now, I want to respond to a specific claim Zach makes regarding the Son of Man figure in the parables of Enoch. Uh, to give some context, the parables of Enoch, which is chapters 37 through 71 of uh, first Enoch, the book of Enoch, there is a messianic figure being described. He goes by several names, including Son of Man, Chosen One, Anointed One, and Righteous One. And these are all names that are given to this messianic figure in the narrative. They all refer to the same person. Well, this figure fulfills all of these messianic prophecies from the Old Testament. He receives worship, he judges the world at the end of the age, and so forth. And what's striking about this figure is that the authors of the parables of Enoch actually tell us who he is. Now, Zach wants to say, without basis, that these passages in First Enoch that talk about the Son of Man they're all prophecies about Yeshua or Jesus the Messiah. And so he and others get very excited uh, about these passages and they say, well, this book is inspired by God because it tells us about Yeshua or Jesus. Well, the problem is that the author of the parables of Enoch directly tells us who this figure is and it's not Yeshua. First Enoch 71.14 reveals Enoch as this figure. Let's look at the passage. This is Enoch speaking. And the head of days came with Michael and Raphael and Gabriel and Phanuel and thousands and tens of thousands of angels without number. And he, some manuscripts read that angel, came to me and greeted me with his voice and said to me, you are that son of man who was born for righteousness and righteousness dwells on you and the righteousness of the head of days will not forsake you. 
So right here, as we just read, Enoch is greeted as this son of man figure that he had seen in his visions. He's even characterized with qualities previously applied to the son of man figure earlier in the story, um, being born for righteousness, etc. Again, uh, I've written on this, see my article linked below. I've also talked about it in several videos and have gone into much more detail. Um, but numerous scholars confirm that this is what the passage is saying, that Enoch is being identified as the son of man. Well, Zach argues that Enoch is not being identified as the son of man in this passage. Listen to what Zach says here. The uh, other guy in this clip, Jake, kind of sets it up for us, and then Zach gives his take and makes a few demonstrably false claims that I want to address. I think I have one more uh, thing to show us here, uh, which is one of the reasons I believe the Book of Enoch is so valuable for us to talk about today is, uh, is that throughout the Book of Enoch, you have the language, uh, the Son of Man, used recurringly over and over with right. divine attributes who is generated before creation, who will act directly in the final judgment and sit on a throne of glory, according to 1 Enoch 46, 1 through 4, 48, 2 through 7, 69, 22 through 29. And also uh, there's an interesting um, uh, exposition on the Messiah. Uh, well, I think I already mentioned it. 48, yeah, 48, um, which is all about uh, our Messiah, Yeshua, I believe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the big arguments against the book of Enoch uh, is in reference to a single verse in chapter 71, and maybe we can talk about that for a moment, is yeah. uh, basically throughout the book of Enoch, Enoch is shown this figure, the son of man, who uh, has all of these divine attributes and stuff. And there's this particular passage in, in Enoch chapter 71, which uh, it, throughout the scripture, he, he talks in the third person, you know, mm -hmm. the Son of Man is always being shown to Enoch. It's always a separate person. But uh, people have looked at this verse in chapter 71. Maybe you can read that. Okay, so first, they agree that these Son of Man passages in the parables of Enoch are about a messianic figure. In fact, they said they believe these are passages about Yeshua. So there's no question that they view the Son of Man in the parables of Enoch as a messianic figure. Let's keep going. It's insane, really. And it's really embarrassing when people claim cling on to 7114 because I have books. I've been studying this for 15 years now, Book of Enoch, even before Torah. I found Enoch first. And I've got books of commentary in my home and uh, written by many scholars. And none of them, none of them ever come to this conclusion that, that the book somehow was labeling Enoch as the Messiah. But they'll use this verse, chapter 71, verse 14, and they will. it says this, and the angel came to me and greeted me with his voice and said to me, this is the son of man who was born to righteousness. And they believe that the real translation is saying the, the angel is telling Enoch that you're the son of, you're the Messiah. You're the son of man. And righteousness abides over him and the righteousness of the head of days forsakes him not. Okay, so Zach claims that no scholar comes to the conclusion that the book of Enoch was labeling Enoch as this messianic figure, the son of man. He later goes on to say that scholars worldwide, nobody comes to that conclusion. Take a listen. Where else in the book of Enoch are you getting that Enoch is told that he is the son of man or he's referred to as the son it, of man? It's, it's, it's a, only that it's one It's a theory verse. that's not continued throughout the rest of the book. And again, yeah. scholars worldwide, no one comes to that conclusion. And I have there's entire books written on this phrase, son of man, written and used in the book of Enoch. And nobody comes to that conclusion. Um, and, and, and I understand that there are people who argue in verse 14 that... Yeah, there may be a bad translation error, but no one comes to the conclusion that the angel saying that Enoch is the Messiah, that's yeah. just not being talked about amongst the academic, academic community. Well, this is just a demonstrably false statement. First, the translation that Zach read from is universally rejected by scholars. The angel doesn't say, this is the son of man, referring to somebody else. He says, you are that son of man, meaning you, Enoch, are that son of man, this messianic figure. Again, I go into more detail about this elsewhere, but this is a well-known emendation in the popular R.H. Charles translation and other versions of First Enoch based on his translation. It's not a mistake. 
R.H. Charles intentionally amended the text to make it say something it doesn't say. Here's Dr. Leslie W. Walk explaining. Charles' solution was to amend the text of 1 Enoch 71.14 to the third person instead of the second person. Thus, Charles read, This is the Son of Man, rather than, You are the Son of Man. Then he made the necessary changes in the rest of the text to bring it into harmony with the third person rendering. He also suggested that a paragraph which revealed the identity of the Son of Man has been lost. But this extensive emendation has no surviving textual basis in any of the manuscripts, and for this reason is to be rejected. Also, listen to renowned scholar Dr. John J. Collins. He says this, The solution of Charles was to amend 71.14 to read, This is the Son of Man, and change you to him in the following verses. This procedure has no basis in the text and is clearly unacceptable. So basically, R.H. Charles theorized that a lost passage revealed the Son of Man figure as someone other than Enoch. Then, based on this theory, he uh, deliberately mistranslated the Ethiopic text to reflect a third-person rendering rather than what the text actually says. The problem is that there is simply no evidence that has ever surfaced to substantiate Charles' theory on which his translation of this passage is based. And for this reason, scholars universally reject R.H. Charles' translation of this passage in favor of a literal rendering of what the verse actually says. Here's a quote from scholars George Nicholsberg and James Vanderkam, and they pretty much say the exact same thing. Charles could not imagine that this author would identify the Son of Man with Enoch. He claimed that a passage had dropped from the text that described the Son of Man accompanying the head of days and a conversation taking place between Enoch and an angel. Verses 14b through 17, he supposed, are the remnant of the angel's description of the function of the Son of Man, which some scribe mistakenly applied to Enoch and transposed into the second person. Charles, in turn, changed the second person pronoun in verse 14b and all the second person pronominal suffixes in verses 14c through 16 into the third person. Charles' tour de force, however, has no foundation in the manuscripts and has been universally rejected by scholars. So I want to give a few more quotes from scholars just to drive home this point, because Zach says that scholars worldwide, nobody comes to the conclusion that Enoch is being identified as the Son of Man in this passage. Well, we already went through a few quotes where scholars have said exactly that, but let's look at a few more. Here's a few from Matthew Black in his paper, The Messianism of the Parables of Enoch, their date and contribution to Christological origins. This is what he says. According to Charles, there was only one Messiah in 1st Enoch outside the parables, the white bull of 1st Enoch 9037. The parables, however, presented in a series of pre-Christian Jewish visions or apocalypses a quasi-human transcendental figure known as the Son of Man, alias, elect one, righteous one, as well as the anointed one, or Messiah, who was to act as the vicegernet of God at the Last Judgment. While not all of Charles' contemporaries agreed with him without question or qualification, few, if any, approved of his adventurous handling of the text at chapter 71, where Enoch is identified with the Son of Man, it was not till the late 30s and early 40s that two longer monographs appeared. So Black is talking about R.H. Charles' work and views, and basically, there is this messianic figure known as the Son of Man in the parables of Enoch. So this is a consensus view among scholars, and everyone pretty much agrees with this, uh, even Zach, that there is this messianic figure known as the Son of Man in the parables of Enoch. Uh, Black also goes on to critique R.H. Charles' treatment of the text in chapter 71, as we already went through, uh, where R.H. Charles amended the text and didn't translate it literally for what it actually said. And Matthew Black right there states that Enoch is identified as the Son of Man figure. Here's another quote from Black. 
The author or final redactor of the parables may have been a member of a Kabbalistic group of the first or second Christian century, but he may also be reproducing an earlier pre-Christian Enoch son of man tradition. This may well be speculation, but the fact of Enoch's elevation as son of man is not. The surprising thing is that no Christian scribe, until large Charles, tampered with the text to remove the scandalon of identifying Enoch with the son of man. So Black says that it's not speculation that Enoch is elevated as the son of man messianic figure in the text. It's not speculation, it's plain as day. He also says it's surprising that no Christian scribe has ever attempted to tamper with the text to remove the fact that Enoch is identified as the son of man, that is, until the 1900s when R.H. Charles amended the text in his translation. But think about that. Black says it's shocking that no Christian scribe in history has attempted to remove this scandal in the text. That is, the claim of Enoch being this messianic figure. It's a scandal uh, to Christians, this idea. I just find that interesting. Here's James Vanderkam saying the same thing in his paper, Righteous One, Messiah, Chosen One, and Son of Man in 1st Enoch 37-71. The final appearance of Son of Man is the most controversial. In 1st Enoch 71-14, Enoch, as he appears before God himself in the heaven of heavens, is identified with the Son of Man. You are the Son of Man, you who were born for righteousness. Here's another quote from Vanderkam. The similitudes, that is the parables of Enoch, have at one time or another been considered a Christian document, though 71.14 has always been somewhat of an embarrassment for this view. A Jewish text with Christian interpolations, such as the Son of Man passages, or a Jewish work with Jewish additions. So right here, Vanderkam cites 71.14, in which Enoch is identified as the Son of Man, as an embarrassment for the view that Christians were the ones that produced the parables of Enoch. Why would it be embarrassing? because the book of Enoch identifies Enoch as the Messiah. So of course it wouldn't be produced by Christians. It would be embarrassing for anyone to suggest such a thing. Here's a, uh, another quote from Vanderkam. In conclusion, it may be said that nothing in the similitudes separates Enoch and the Son of Man slash Chosen One in the sense that they are two distinct beings. This entails that the identification of Enoch as the Son of Man in 7114 is not inconsistent with the remainder of the composition. So according to Dr. James Vanderkam, nothing throughout the parables of Enoch indicates that Enoch and this messianic Son of Man figure are two distinct people. By the way, I highly recommend James Vanderkam's paper if you're interested in a scholarly treatment of this issue. He shows how the revealing of Enoch as the Son of Man fits the um, logical flow of the story. In other words, it's the dramatic climax of the entire story that has actually been prepared for by the author. There are literary hints throughout the text leading up to this conclusion. So it's not like this uh, idea that some people say, like, it just doesn't make sense that Enoch would be identified as the Son of Man because there's nothing in the text indicating that anywhere else. Well, actually, there is. There's literary hints all over the place, and uh, James Vanderkam documents these. I'll just give one example that uh, Vanderkam cites. Here's what he says. A biographical point about Enoch should be made because it demonstrates the intimate connection between chapters 37 through 69 and 70 through 71. The author of the similitudes has furnished several notices which indicate that he has the entire biblical career of Enoch in mind as he presents the visions that constitute the book. In the first verse of the similitudes, 37.1, he provides a reversed genealogy of Enoch, which is drawn from Genesis 5, 1 through 24. It is intriguing that two of the names in the genealogy offer a suggestive idea. Since Walda is used before each name, one twice reads expressions which in the original language meant literally son of man. Enoch is son of Enosh equals son of man, and son of Adam equals son of man. It is not impossible that the writer is indulging in a sort of wordplay which prepares the reader, however obliquely, for Enoch's identification 
revelation of Son of Man in 7114. All right, let's see, what else do we have here? Here's another quote from Dr. Leslie Walk. He says, the whole flow of the narrative points to Enoch's dramatic identification as the Son of Man. The attributes with which he is spoken of here cohere extremely well with the Son of Man in the visions. He is bathed in righteousness, born for it, it abides with him, and God's righteousness will not forsake him. Further, God promises him peace and that all the righteous will be eternally present with him. These attributes all tend to underscore Enoch's identification as the Son of Man, not merely as one of the righteous humans who are already in heaven. For the reader, the identification of Enoch and the Son of Man is dramatic, but it has been prepared for. And for good measure, here's a quote from another scholar, Andrew Henry, who agrees that Enoch is identified as this messianic figure. Here's what he says. In one chapter, Enoch sees a vision in which the Son of Man is commissioned. He will be the staff for the righteous. He will be the light of the nations, and all who dwell on the earth will fall down and worship before him. For those of you familiar with the New Testament, this sort of language should sound familiar as it's all applied to Jesus as well. But in this text, Enoch himself is named the Son of Man. Chapter 71, 14 says, You, Enoch, are that Son of Man who was born for righteousness. So Zach's claim that no scholar holds this view is demonstrably false. I just quoted several scholars who say precisely what Zach says no scholar has ever said. Let's move on. Zach attempts to argue against what the text says. He says that Enoch is not being identified as this Son of Man figure in uh, chapter 71, verse 14. He says that the text teaches that the Messiah, that is Yeshua, is being introduced to Enoch, not Enoch identifying Enoch as the Messiah. He says the very next verse actually demonstrates this. Listen to what he says. And I will say, no, 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 this is the angel having the Messiah introduced to Enoch, this, that saying that this, the Messiah here, is the righteous son of man. And the very next verse debunks their argument. It says this, And he said to me, colon, He proclaims to you peace in the name of the world to come. So he said to me, meaning the angel said to Enoch, yeah. he proclaims to you. Folks, that, anyone with a higher than third grade education tells you, can tell you that, that there's three people in this conversation. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. It's insanity. Okay. So it's easy to see how Zach's explanation here doesn't work. It doesn't prove or explain his view in any way. Of course, there are more than two people involved here. That's what the text says. There's Enoch, the head of days, and a bazillion other angels, right? Let's look at verses uh, 13 through 15 and see what it says. And the head of days came with Michael and Raphael and Gabriel and Phanuel and thousands and tens of thousands of angels without number. And he, again, some manuscripts read that angel, came to me and greeted me with his voice and said to me, me, you are that son of man who is born for righteousness, and righteousness dwells on you, and the righteousness of the head of days will not forsake you. And he said to me, he proclaims peace to you in the name of the age that is to be, for from there peace has proceeded from the creation of the age, and thus you will have it forever and forever and ever. So, Zach claims that the Messiah, Yeshua, is the one being identified as the Son of Man in this passage, and that Enoch is being introduced to the Son of Man here. But that's not what the text says. Verse 15 doesn't change what verse 14 clearly says, that Enoch is being identified as the Son of Man. You, Enoch, are that Son of Man. And nowhere is there a separate Son of Man entity mentioned anywhere in the text. Here's what's going on. In verse 14, one of the angels says to Enoch, you are that son of man, and the righteousness of the head of days will not forsake you. Then in verse 15, the angel says again, he, that is the head of days, proclaims peace to you in the name of the age that is to be. So a far more reasonable and simple explanation is to just go by what the text tells us. Zach assumes that there is a distinct Son of Man entity in this passage. If we just read it, we see that Enoch is identified as the Son of Man, and the angel introduces Enoch to the Head of Days and proclaims to Enoch peace in the name of the Head of Days. Nicholsberg confirms that some manuscripts state that an angel is the one 
someone speaking to Enoch. In verse 14a, the manuscripts differ as to who is speaking to Enoch. Instead of, and he, some manuscripts read, and that angel. If that angel is original, the text is vague as to which angel is speaking to Enoch. This explanation makes sense in light of what the text actually says. Zach is making assumptions that have no basis in the text itself. We ought to rather let the text speak for itself and draw conclusions based on what the text says. Here we have Enoch, we have the head of days, we have Michael and Fanuel and a billion other angels, right? So of course there are more people involved in the text, it's not just two people, and an angel is speaking to Enoch and talking about the head of days, the he, the head of days, proclaims to you. So there's no contradiction. Uh, the, the, verse 15 doesn't refute the idea that uh, Enoch is identified as the Son of Man at all. It's just not there. Again, as James Vanderkam said, nothing in the similitudes separates Enoch and the Son of Man slash Chosen One in the sense that they are two distinct beings. Now, the fact that the book of Enoch identifies Enoch, not Yeshua, as the Messiah, the Son of Man, is pretty problematic, as I've argued elsewhere. This is one of the reasons the book of Enoch is not considered scripture because it teaches a false messiah. We can read the book of Enoch and it can be edifying in the sense of giving us a window into the world of Second Temple Judaism and uh, the beliefs and the ideas of that time, but that's it. It's not scripture. It's not inspired. Hey, thank you guys for watching. I hope this video was helpful. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments below. Also, uh, please subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell so that you'll be notified when I release new content like this. Again, hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you next time. Blessings and shalom.